Steve can try to do a close. No, not you. Sorry, Lynn. The link to the educational portion. Linda didn't get it. It's on the bottom of the agenda. I think she tried. I sent it to her. I know I sent it to her. You sent it to her? Yeah. Okay. Did you send it like within the past half hour? No, I sent it to her when she. Today about I don't know four or something. Okay. Well, she's having trouble. Okay. Okay. Hey, Steve, can you practice seeing if you can see? Hold on just a second. There you go. Well, I mean, I mean, you gotta get a point yeah, to it. Five minutes to talk. Oh, so much problem. <coughs> there you go. You're doing it. You're doing it. It comes from me. Try, try to uh, get closer. Right in there. Right when you need Yep, that's it. That's it. You're there. So I meant to tell you, Mary. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was collating. Couldn't. Couldn't answer my phone. Sure. Okay. Where does it go? Awesome. 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 Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Come here. You have family. Is it over on the coast? Yes. I didn't mind. Let me see. What is it working for? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was just surprised to see you. No, I'm marking I'm marking the side of the side. I had no idea. That was jumpy. That's what I did. No. No. Because that's my day job. Real job, too. The one that actually pays. Yeah. That's what I did here. But it's very interesting. Still admitting people here. Network. Uh, Let's sneak around back and fix it. <laughs> is it right beside it works. Yeah, hopefully. Whatever you need to do, Steve, I appreciate it. It's very, 
Did you say that um, Brenda's here or I don't know, oh, she's in? Okay. Okay, cool. Well then, um, Vicki, I think that you're good to introduce Amy. Okay. Aloha, everybody. I'm thrilled to introduce Amy Anderson, who is a very active member of our community beekeepers. She's going to tell us tonight about uh, what plants to grow for to support bees. And I am fascinated by this, and I want to give a big thanks to Joe Whitfield, who brought her name forward as a speaker. Amy, thanks for coming, and we're looking forward to your program. Take it away. All right. Hi, guys. I'm so happy, excited, and nervous to be here. <laughs> I'm coming at you. Disclaimer, I'm not a master gardener. <laughs> but I'm learning and I'm going in that direction. Um, I started my gardening journey in conjunction with my bees. The bees came first and I love my bees and I'm excited to be here and talk to you about them. So those are my bees. Those are my two beehives. That's my little apiary, which is the fancy word for where you keep your bees. Um, that's a little bee patio. It's about 25 feet away from my front door. Sounds scary, but it's not. <laughs> so when we're talking about bees, we're always gonna be thinking about honey. In America, how much honey do we need? How much honey do we use? How much honey do we eat? It depends on who you are. I think that furry guy eats more than I do. The um, Honey Council of America says that we eat on average 1.3 pounds of honey per American in this country. 1.3 pounds for each of us. So it's like, well, all right, a pound of honey. Let's round down, let's keep our numbers easy. What does it take to make a pound of honey? A lot of flowers, way more than what I thought. It takes two million flowers to gather the resources needed to make one pound of honey. The bees do this in a series of numerous trips. They can only carry the resources of about 50 to 100 flowers before their pollen baskets and their honey stomach becomes full. They go home, they park it, younger bee sisters help unload, and then the forager goes right back out there. Their game is speed and they are focused about it. How many miles does that take to go back and forth to make a pound of honey? This, it's so crazy. When, and I, I had to look at different sources, 50,000 miles bees travel to make one pound of honey. If you walk around the world, that's only 25,000. I mean, you know, so basically our little sweet bees are flying around the world twice to make what we want and need. One colony produces 60 to 100 pounds of honey a year. Now, I'm a new beekeeper. You don't expect any honey your first year of beekeeping. They have to eat it because their big job that first year is to make the initial honeycomb. In order to create that beeswax, you have to stimulate your wax gland. And to do that, you have to gorge on honey. How much? Seven pounds to make one pound of beeswax. It's the most expensive thing that any colony ever does is that initial honeycomb build. How can we help? Bees just need a couple of things, little sweet creatures that they are. They need nectar from the flowers. They need pollen from the flowers for protein. That's how they rear their young. And they need water, a clean source. This lecture is not about trees. But man, when I talk about plants for bees, we have to talk about trees. The trees are the best ones. Our best plants for bees are in fact trees. Um, they like maples. Service berry is something that I recently learned about. I'm gonna be buying some of those. Um, I like them for the bees. I also, who doesn't like tiger swallowtail butterflies? You know, I would like to support those more. And obviously I wanna mention the keystone species, which I'm sure everyone knows about, the native oak, the willow and the plum to support the biggest you know, population of, of different insects that are local. Flowers, all the colors that we have. Hummingbirds love red. Chickens love the color red. I like purple. Bees like blue. That's their favorite color. Bees love the color blue. Given an option between a red one and a blue one, they're always gonna go for the blue one. They like it better. So let's talk about blue flowers. So, Penstemon, I don't have this one in my garden yet. I would like it. Um, you have about 250 uh, species in North America. Um, the ones that are native to Indiana 
are foxglove and, um, and the smooth. Both of both of those are native. I love this. So when I first started with these, <laughs> I came here for a bee meeting, checked out your guys' glorious wall of info and snagged this about a year ago. <laughs> I like to keep it with me when I'm shopping for flowers. Um, it's hard to buy native. It, it just is. And I didn't realize the struggle when I first started because I thought this is at Home Depot. It's fine. <laughs> Look, there's a sale at Walmart. I want it all. <laughs> Easy. And then, then you learn a little bit more. It's like, oh, <laughs> my time. So anywho, I am slowly replacing my non-natives, trying to do the best that I can with my little space. Salvia, this is not native um, to Indiana, native to North America. Um, I wouldn't mind having this in my garden. They, uh, they sell it at Walmart, it's everywhere. A native alternative would be the blue vervain. Um, it's taller and kind of messier though. So, but it looks very similar. And did you know we should not chew the leaves of the salvia plant? I didn't know that. It causes, it, it'll cause you to hallucinate. So don't chew the leaves of the salvia plant. <laughs> Catnip. I learned about this one. Um, I, I think I'm going to add it. It makes a wonderful tea. Lots of little flowers for the bees. It also scares away the squash beetles. So if you plant it with your potatoes, pumpkins, and whatnot, um, I had a little struggle with a, with some squash beetle. So maybe a little cat mitt might be the, the thing for me. We've got some Russian sage, nice and blue. Um, Vicky's not native. Vicky's favorite. Oh, is it? Oh, that is Vicky's favorite. We should all have it in our gardens. The bees would love it. What I love about this one is how long it blooms. You know, when we're trying to think about feeding, you know, colony of insects, we always want to be having them, having something available for them. Wisteria, slow but not fussy. If you get the North American uh, type, the um, Asian is it's, it's it's a little aggressive. So I was very interested to find out that we have a native alternative to wisteria, and it looks like it can grow just about anywhere. Full sun, partial shade, doesn't care what soil it's in. That's nice. This is a weird one, right? That's what I said when I saw it. Now you gotta be careful with the internet. I feel like sometimes they, they lie about the colors of things. There's colors of this stuff that looks like cartoons. I do not believe this plant actually looks like a cartoon. These were the most realistic hued pictures that I could find. It's a sea holly. Um, I, you know, it's it, the blue extends all the way down and they say it retains it when it's dry. Um, it needs full sun or it's gonna tip over. Um, it's not a true thistle. Sorry, that was me. Oh, Sorry okay. <laughs> what are you doing? Sorry. Um, anywho, you can buy that, it, it's available. Verbena was another one that I learned about. Now this one's an annual. So if you're worried about not planting, you know, native, well, it only lasts a year. So surely that's okay. But lots of different types, different sizes. Um, there's the blue variety right there. Lamb's ear came up in my research. I don't know how I feel about lamb's ear. Um, it's interesting. I like the different color foliage. But it's a fast spreader. It's in the mint family. So you got to be careful. I mean, it'd be nice to have a little bit of interest. I don't want it taking over my garden. I almost took this slide out. But it's blue and bees love it. Ooh, I have this one. I love this one. Blue spirea. My, I have the dark knight uh, caryoptans. This thing's amazing. Everything else is dead but not your blue spirea. End of fall, you know, you have that in the blanket flower. That's pretty much all, all I had left. When I'm planting for bees, I want to think about, I want the first bloomers and I want the last bloomer and everything in between. I always want something to be blooming. Can't always go native if you wanted something to bloom in November. Aster flowers, so many different types, so great. I bought mine at Walmart. They're probably from Asia. Um, <laughs> I have to figure that out. Um, you have, with all the different varieties, you can't run into the, the taller ones, you know, that kind of look a little weedy. I'm doing my work. Anyone live in a subdivision? Any subdivision living? 
he felt like, oh, good, yay, yay. Okay, so you have to do things a little bit differently. We have to keep things neat. We have to keep things tidy. I'm always aware of that with my bees. Never do I want things to look, I don't know, strange, unusual, unkept. Um, it's something that I think about. I don't want complaints. I know that being a beekeeper in a subdivision is a little bit off kilter. There we go. Oh, whoa, caught up. There we are. Sunflowers. The only great thing about living in a subdivision, there are no squirrels. So you can plant as many sunflowers as you want. Plant a forest, plant a thicket. Wow. But then you just walk through your little sunflower forest, feel like Snow White with all of those little yellow birds flying away. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> These are my sunflowers. This is my bee garden right there. Um, that's what started, that's what started everything was my bee garden. A couple more examples of the different sunflowers. This thing was fun. That was from Nigeria. Not native. It was not a native sunflower. But that seed head, it was this that you could stand underneath of it. I mean, it got so heavy, it kind of leans over. But the birds loved it. The bees loved it. Had a good time. <laughs> so, we make flowers now that don't produce pollen. They're like they're science flowers. Um, right. So you want to avoid the pro cut series. I had a shopping basket full of beautiful pink sunflowers in different hues, but they are they're this other type of flower that, that that's popular with florists, people with allergies, but they don't produce pollen, which is weird. But that that's don't buy pro cut if you're looking to have a pollen, you know, for your bees. The ones that you should look for are Lemon Queen, Mammoth Gray Stripe, Maximilian was one, Chocolate Cherry, Autumn Beauty, Giant White Seeded, which is misleading. They call it Giant White, but that's just really referring to the seeds. It's not a white sunflower. There's not a natural white sunflower. Pro Cut makes a beautiful white sunflower. Once again, no, nothing good for bees. <laughs> Blanket flower, this was my lucky find. So those are my blanket flowers with bees on them. And I just noticed that the bees flocked to the blanket flower. I plan on separating those, maybe buying more. They loved them and they just would not stop blooming. They were all the way up until the snow. I still had blanket flower blossoms. They, they are the flowers that won't die. Um, you know, I don't have if they're native or not, probably because I was afraid to look because I love them so much. <laughs> Definitely putting in more. Are those annuals or? No, no they're perennials. Okay. Yeah. Nice low growing habit. They were not yes. very tall. Yeah. The other um, late autumn joy for bees is sedum, not native to Indiana. The only um, native Indiana sedum that we have is this cute little guy. He's tiny, um, whereas your autumn joy, you know, bigger. So this cute little thing, early spring bloomer, evergreen, I'm sure she's lovely. But the autumn joy sedum, if you're looking for a bee magnet, they just clump on it. So I will be adding that. Herbs, that came up and a couple of different, different sources kept coming back to the herbs. I was a little confused about that because I know with my herbs, I've always grown herbs in pots. I don't consider that really fancy gardening. It isn't. But I mean, never am I wanting my things to go to seed. I just always throw, you know, keep that down low. And I did have lavender. I planted that. Um, I have my little note here. Consider your hive placement. So a beehive has an entrance. The bees come and go, obviously. Bees are very picky about their bathroom habits. These are clean bugs. They're very picky about how they keep their hive and how they keep themselves. They will not go to the restroom inside of a hive. That is forbidden. The queen does. She has a whole cadre of ladies taking care of her. And of course, boy bees, they, they also do. The ladies clean up after them. Um, but that's it. The, 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 you don't have, you only have one queen. And you have some boys, not a lot, where you have thousands of workers who will, and they just are very clean. So when they go out of their hive, they're going to go to the restroom. If you put a raised garden bed too close to the entrance of your beehive, 
Well, guess what? That's potty space, and they will not do your pollination in that, as I learned with my lavender raised garden bed. It's okay. It turns out bumblebees aren't as picky. So <laughs> they'll, they'll still work for you, but, but your bees won't. If you have made a planting that they consider inside of their lavatory space, they will not pollinate inside of there. Um, calamint, basil, rosemary were the ones that were mentioned repeatedly. Oh, I'm excited about bees. I drove by a house in Anderson and they had these tall aliens and they were amazing. How Dr. Seuss is that? <laughs> so uh, they're not native. I bought them anyway and I planted them and I cannot wait for them to grow. I hope that they are a nice counterpoint with my sunflowers. Bees will love them, butterflies will love them. A million flowers on a ball, everybody's favorite. All kinds of different colors, obviously. Mm. So, away from flowers. With my garden, and like I said, not a master gardener, not even a very good gardener, although the pandemic has been an amazing opportunity to stay home, <laughs> learn, you know, branch out a bit. What I saw this past year with my garden, gardening with bees, was nothing short of incredible. Cantaloupe, those are my cantaloupes. I planted four little cantaloupe seedlings. I got them on clearance from a nursery and just planted them on a lark. I grabbed some watermelon too. From those four little cantaloupe vines, I grew over 22 high quality, wonderful cantaloupes. I was giving them away. It doesn't matter how much you or your family like cantaloupe. 22 is too many. And they all came into season, like just one right after the other. I left a couple on the vines because you know, if you're harvesting, it's like, well, maybe those will keep for a few days. They don't, they explode. They just pop open. <laughs> there you are with broken cantaloupes, which becomes, you know, meals for bugs of different sorts. The watermelon also did well. They take longer. Um, so I, I did harvest some nice watermelon. I think I got like three, three good watermelon. One that was like, eh, not so great. And then 15 other watermelons that they didn't have time to ripen. What do you do? Well, it's the end of summer. You paint them orange and you pass them off as pumpkins. <laughs> no one knew. I had my whole bee garden decorated with these things. It was so festive. <laughs> Grew some Brussels sprouts this year. Never had success with that. I thank the bees. Um, there's a lot of studies, a million studies, and everyone throws out different numbers. It doesn't matter what the numbers are because they're crazy from 5% to 70%. It's all good things. Bees will increase your yield. And I knew this. They are helping my farmer friend when he plants his soybeans. My bees are increasing his yield. I don't know why I didn't draw that, you know, connect the dots and think, well, they're also going to help me. I didn't really think that. I really wasn't gardening for bees. The flowers were for the bees. The honey is for them and also my family. But to have such a Huge, just a lot. It was, it was crazy, like a cornucopia. I mean, and so I just, the bees, they will help pollinate. You will see a difference. Let's talk about loofah. I love loofah. I'm sure every, I hope that every gardener has a plant that just makes them smile. Loofah makes me smile. <laughs> I have some. <laughs> loofah is incredible. It's, um, it's in the cucumber family. It, uh, they grow gourds. If you harvest them when they're young and green, you can eat them. I've never eaten loofah. I probably ought to. I like it so much. But I grow it until, until it's ready. Now, here in Indiana, you can't leave it on the vine this long. The frost will get it, and it will rot. So you leave it on the vine for as long as you can. And then when you know we're going to get our first hard frost, well, you pick your loofah, you bring them in. They have to cure for a couple of months. It's a slow process. I stick mine on top of my refrigerator and just kind of forget about them. <laughs> so here we are, you know, end of February. This was from the summer. It's ready to be harvested. You can hear it. It sounds like a maraca. Um, I will peel this off, which is so messy. Do it outside. <laughs> and then you are left with the inside of your loofah plant, of your gourd. 
From there, you can take the whole thing and I just soak it in bleach water. Just a couple of minutes is all it takes. That makes it nice and white, bleaches it out. And then you let it dry. You can <laughs> cut it into slices, which I do. These are great. You can use these for so many things. I use them for washing, for scrubbing dishes. I use them for bath and beauty products. And then when you're done with it, you just compost it because <laughs> it's you just give it back to the earth. And so you're not, it's not going to a landfill or anything else. And they are so useful. So if anybody wants, <laughs> I brought Lucas seeds. So do agree to help yourself to a little package of Lucas seeds. You're going to want to soak them for 24 hours before you plant them in your little chippy things or whatever fancy master gardeners. I don't know what you guys do. <laughs> I, I soak mine for 24 hours and I put them in one of those little, you know, pit pat things. You get the water and the peat pellets and they grow. That's how I did it. And then I transfer them. They need a couple weeks beforehand. I'll be starting my lupa probably next weekend. And then you just, you know, take them outside and let them grow. Be careful where you plant it. Lupa's a climber. Um, the first year I planted lupa, it was going great on my lovely trellis that I had provided for it. And then we went away for a long weekend and a storm came and it blew. Part of the lupa vine fell off of the trellis and it just landed on my window. At which point it entrenched itself into the screen and grew up the side of my house, all the way up to the second story. It was really quite incredible. So it's growing, and then it's, it's, it's deciding to make loofahs. So they're growing from my growth. And you know, I'm worried about that because not a good gardener it never had happened before. And I'm wondering, how do you harvest? You know, what if the one grows in my gutter? What will that do? A storm came, you know, as happens in Indiana, and you know, the wind, and you can kind of hear them thumping against the house. <laughs> What's that gonna do? Nothing, as it turned out. Thank God for miracles, hooray. Um, but so you wanna just be careful. You have to control it and really stay on top of it. Um, this spring, what a, it was kind of a grumpy spring. I lost all of my lufa plants. And that was sad until this one cropped up. Remember when I said that cleaning lufa plant is messy? I did it outside, right there. And so I had a volunteer lufa plant. And man, you, you read about lufa and it's like, this is a fussy, hard to grow plant. Well, not if it's a volunteer. My husband mowed over it several. He didn't want a lufa plant growing there. And um, it just would not die. And so I took one of those little cheap, you know, trellisy things that towers, you can get at Hobby Lobby, stuck it on top and it just grew there. That's my little volunteer loofah harvest and once again I think the bees are what helps make such a wonderful harvest from one plant of loofah that would not die so help yourself to some loofah and some ecological good you know home fun <laughs> oh ladies almost forgot so I haven't learned how to make soap yet it's on my life list um <laughs> Currently, I cheat and I just melt down glycerin. And so you can put your loofah in a muffin tin, melt down some glycerin soap, pour it on top, and then you have soap impregnated loofah. I didn't make this up. Um, I saw this at uh, oh, the Hallmark store here, Cynthia's Hallmark. I bought one of these things, I don't know, maybe four years ago. And, um, but then as soon as I learned out, learned that you can grow loofah, I'm not going to buy that from Cynthia's anymore. I can make my own. <laughs> With meaning. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe. Yeah, I think we're almost done. <laughs> That's a good stopping point for you. Yeah, right? Well, the mouse and on the bus. It's so awesome. Is that awesome? Let the mouse go back. Do it. Can I ask a question while he's working on it? Oh, yes, sure. yes, yes. So. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, people that do trails might be threatened by bees. That's kind of the philosophy, right? That's why we, we attract butterflies and not bees. But 
I'm on the assumption that bees kind of mind their own business and deliver flowers. But what um, is there a distance or um, I don't know. Yes. How, how, so okay. how am I able to keep bees in a subdivision? That's crazy. The first bee book I ever read was the Urban Guide to Beekeeping. And I'm glad that was my first one because it was so inspiring. It turns out that a beehive only needs 10 feet around it. That's all you need. They fly high. How bees like to be 100 feet in the air. That's their sweet spot. So they are flying. They leave their hive. They are flying on a trajectory straight up. And they're going to level off at about 100 feet if they have far, you know, far ways to go. So my hives sit, they are 33 feet away from the sidewalk. By the time my bees are flying over that sidewalk, they're over people's heads because they're higher than the street sign, which I measured at 12 feet. So that's where they are. So for the most part, people aren't aware that I even have bees in my neighborhood. They're not, I had a neighbor, I spoke to my immediate neighbors, obviously, before I did this. I did have one neighbor that did have concerns. She was concerned that she would be on her back porch reading, enjoying her space, and that she would be harassed by the bees. I had to tell her that she wasn't a flower. <laughs> we don't talk as much anymore. She doesn't like hearing that. <laughs> bees are picky and precise. When a forager leaves her hive, she has a plan in place. She already knows where she's going to go and what resource she's going to collect once she comes back. You know, that's her job. There are a few scout bees, the explorers of the group, we all have to have them. They're gonna go out and they're gonna be a little bit more meandering, you know, they're looking for stuff. They're not looking for people. We don't have any of the resources that they're looking for. Bees only want three things, pollen, nectar, water. We don't have that. And they're so controlled by pheromones and their jobs. I found that most people that were afraid of bees were actually talking about yellow jackets, mm -hmm. which I'm totally on board with. Those are the jerks of the insect kingdom. <laughs> Important pollinators, they might be. I don't know. But they are omnivorous. They're, they'll go after everything. Our trash, we see them at the ballparks. You're never going. You're not going to see honeybees roaming around trash. You're not going to see honeybees uh, pestering people for no reason. They, they just. That's not how they behave. They're shy, focused, and they have a job, and they don't care about you. Isn't it honeybees that collect at the, at the Coke cups and? Pepsi cans at, at the Friday days. Those are yellow jackets. Those are yellow jackets. Okay. So you're you're talking about the kind of bees, right? Yes. So because I have someone that yeah, wants to put up, yeah, be a tractor to collect his bees to take back to his beehive. Wait, what? Uh, no. I understood that correct. What? So this so he wants to plant things and take bees from those bees already have a home. You should not take bees. That's kidnapping. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. But they have a home. It used to be bees used to be kind of kind of an invasive species themselves. There was a time when the the honeybee could survive just fine without a keeper. That's not the case anymore. Only six percent of honeybees can survive in the wild. So there just aren't very many that are unaccounted for that you could take with you and stick in another hive. That's his plan to gather uh, up different yeah, honeybees? No, I told him to find more information. That's a good thing. Yeah, That's yeah. That's all I said at the yeah. time when we moved out. Well, so like, finding yeah. more information, I don't really know where you're going with this. And I hadn't really heard Well, if you want to be, a, if someone wants to be a beekeeper, you buy a hive. Um, well, you go to a bee meeting first. Go to a bee meeting. You will be inundated by people that love bees. Yeah. I'm not well, hearing hives, but you know, hives are kind of. He already has hives, and he's still. But you know, hives have kind of had a problem. Now, when we're using nomenclature, a hive, I'm referring to a wooden box. Is that what you're referring to? So, but, uh, but in the neighborhood. Yes. But, but you know, I mean, uh, bees or bees have. Bee hives have um, struggled recently. Oh yes, no, the entire topic. Well, all of our pollinators are struggling. Well, it's a rough time to be an insect in America. Um, 
But no, that, that, there's, that the hobbyist is an important part of, of beekeeping. I'll never be a commercial beekeeper, but I'm still serving a purpose by keeping, you know, genetically different bees, you know, in my area. You should be able to go on to the next slide. If oh, you want. Thank you. How yeah. many bees, how far do bees travel? Five miles. Ten miles. I was just going to say that. We have, we have a swarm. Oh, you lucky, lucky! What did you do? <laughs> I didn't feel lucky. By did you not feel lucky? Because I didn't. But uh, that's when I started reading up on bees. Yeah. The beehive people were, I didn't know he even had hives. You know, and he was mm -hmm. right over there. Yeah. And then I read a book to where bees will, they can actually come back to the hive. They uh -huh. send out a few. Uh -huh. They come back to the hive, and the way they move their wings and their legs, they tell the hive, this is where we're going to go. They dance. It's yeah, called the wedding dance. dance. The way yeah, yeah. Way. That's but, one uh, way that they communicate. Yeah. My, so do, does your swarm? All bees swarm. So that's how they reproduce. That's how the, that's the only way a colony can reproduce is by swarming. Must have been, they said beekeepers, we, well, we, we try to man, we, uh, beekeepers try to manage that as best as they possibly can. Um, they will manipulate the hive in different ways. We can cut a colony in half artificially, hope that the queenless ones make a queen. Maybe we don't have, live on hope anymore and we buy a queen and put it in there. There's different ways that we try to manage swarming. Mm -hmm. As a beekeeper, I don't want my half of my bees to leave and go somewhere else and me not be able to recapture. The goal is always to recapture your swarm, <laughs> which is why I planted lemongrass. <laughs> one, one last question. Please, on that. please, Annie. Did you start your beehive? So I went to Baston Bees. I took my intro to beekeeping course through Baston's. They're in Knightstown. They're a local commercial beekeeper um, establishment. I took their class and I ordered what's called a nucleus colony. A nucleus colony is the fastest, easiest, most stable way to start with beekeeping. A nucleus colony, as the name suggests, is the smallest component of a colony structure that you can have without the whole thing just collapsing. So you, are, you have a box of bees. There's gonna be five frames, which are the things that go inside of your beehive. Four to 6,000 bees, one queen. You put it in your car and you drive home with it. <laughs> There's different ways to get bees. I was nervous. I was nervous. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I had this this fear, you know, this is fear that I'd be driving down the highway and a little bee would fly, across, you know, and how did it get out? Who knows? But no, they it's they have it down to an art. It's all packaged, sealed. You drive them home open the box up outside right by your hives and just put them into their new home. There's other ways you can buy packages of bees and those will come to you via mail delivery. Mail eh, carriers don't want to carry our bees. No one does. I mean, that's weird and stressful for the bees. It's hard. Sometimes the queen will die. It's just, it's hard and stressful to move a colony that way. So I try, I, I keep local. If I can't drive and get my bees, I probably don't need those bees. To keep them from swarming. Bees love lemongrass. Lemongrass doesn't have any flowers. They're not pollinating it. They love the smell. Bees, in addition to dancing to communicate, also use pheromones, the smelling. They love lemongrass. To a bee, a lemongrass is a message that says, come here, this is the place to be. And so they will follow that smell. We use lemongrass essential oils in our bait traps. We're trying to be swarm catchers and catch a swarm because we don't want to buy another one. From that's, that's not kidnapping. <laughs> they're looking for a new home if they're already swarming. I mean, I was helping them out. <laughs> so if they swarm, you want you would get a box and you know any keeper. If anyone comes across a swarm, my gosh, call a keeper. You don't know a keeper, call someone who might. They'll get in touch with Ron. Ron will send somebody and we will go and get your swarm with smiles on our faces and bring you some honey back the next year.
Oh, the other nice thing. So lemongrass. My bees didn't swarm this year. They were too young. I didn't think that they would, but the lemongrass was just in case. Um, I learned that you can just dry it and it makes the most amazing green tea, which turns out is good. It's so full of antioxidants. It's good for your digestion. And that's all it takes is you just dry out the leaves, and cut them, and you have tea. Energy level. <laughs> yeah. Right? Lemongrass. <laughs> it's what fuels me. <laughs> <sighs> so why be a keeper of bees? Why would anyone want to do this? All I can say is that spending the spring with my bees is transformative. Sitting and watching them flow in and out of the hive is mesmerizing. It's meditative. It's calming. It's beautiful to see all the different things that they do on their little front porch as the season progresses, it's amazing. They have to air condition it in summer. It gets too hot for bees. Your hive is an incubator for babies. We can't let that thing go over 100 or everything will die inside of it. And so the bees will line. You open up your entrance to make it nice and wide in the summer. And they line up in rows in front of that entrance. And they beat their little wings so hard and they're making wind. They're creating ventilation that will go through and cool their hive. Water, we said nectar, pollen, and water, the three things that bees need. They're going to take extra water in the summer, and they're going to fill those little honeycomb spaces. So instead of having honey or bee bread in there, there's going to be water in there. And what's a bee going to do? She's going to flap her little wings so hard, and that's going to cause evaporation to cool the hive. It's almost like it's sweating, you know? That's how we cool ourselves. So I enjoy watching them. You can sit close to your bees. I'm not a flower either. They don't care about me. So I can just sit and I can watch my bees. If this is my hive, I'm sitting about here and I'm watching them. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, bees have designated flight paths to get back to their home. If you accidentally sit in front of one, you might get bumped in the head by a bee. This doesn't hurt. It's fine. They're surprised too, you know? And so they just bumble around in your hair just for a second and then they figure things out and go around you. The honey, um, man, there's a Netflix uh, show called Rotten. Has anybody delved into that, showing all the holes in our, uh, our food system? Right? <laughs> we don't need to know too much about that. But there is an episode on honey of, of honey in there. And what they're finding is all of our imports are contaminated. It's not actually honey that we're buying at the grocery store, oftentimes. If it came from out of this country, you're running a really good shot that they've cut it with high fructose corn syrup. Honey's expensive. Corn syrup isn't. Put it in there. We can't tell the difference. And so there's a lot of that. It's the tainted supply. Honey is also good for allergies. I have allergies. Um, nothing is more better for me than my local backyard honey for my allergies. So I appreciate it for that. Um, I was amazed, like I said, with my garden, not a big gardener, growing, growing to become one, enjoying every minute of it. But to see the change and having be the, the only factor that changed was, was the bees and having such a, such a harvest. It was really gratifying. So those are why I keep bees. I like it. It makes my neighbors, I feel, a little bit more ecological friendly. They're using fewer poisons. Now, that's just my close neighbors, my whole other, you know, the whole entire neighborhood, you know, let's spray for mosquitoes. <laughs> let's just flame throw the world with poison. Um, but keeping the bees has just been so good for me, for my garden. It's been a wonderful hobby. I've enjoyed it a lot. Ron is a beekeeper of some renown. Ron has been keeping bees. How long have you been keeping bees, Ron? 1960s. Wow. There you go. Ron is somewhat of my mentor. So if I don't know what to do with the bees, I give Ron a call. Would you like to have, you have words? Would I like? Would you like to come speak? Have some words? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you through? Yes. Any questions? You sure. No, I think we're good. Take it away, Ron. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll set this right here. It's a, it's a 
plastic box. She made mention of the nuke box, nucleus box, and that's how most beekeepers begin to keep bees. So we, we buy our first start of bees in a nuke box. Used to be wooden, but a couple of years ago, they came out with these plastic ones uh, with the price of lumber and everything going up. I'm glad they did because these can be purchased now pretty reasonable. And it gives us a way to transport bees. Uh, uh, just you can go anywhere with them. They have good, good. Uh, Ventilation in there? Yeah, it can be sealed up good. They're not gonna get out and escape in your car. And uh, so that's what we're using nowadays to start off a beehive. And, you know, it's really hard to follow Amy because I'm, <laughs> you know, we, we, we know she's bubbly and exciting and she does this all the time. And, and me, I'm just the opposite. I'm just an old farm boy, kind of ultra conservative. I grew up over here in Rush County on a small farm. And uh, when I got out into the world, I was moving around and, and away from home a lot and doing a lot of different things. And there's no way I could keep farm animals in my backyard or in my apartment where I live. So I chose beekeeping as a hobby way back in the 60s. And that's when I purchased my first bees from a, from a beekeeper up in Michigan. I lived up there. And uh, uh, I picked them up uh, one night. I borrowed a friend and my friend's pickup. And we went and uh, picked up two hives of bees. And this old beekeeper, I don't I have no idea of his name now, uh, but, he, but he had uh, uh, bricks on top of his beehive. Beekeepers do this sometimes. I still do it. And he was grumbling while we were loading the beehives. He said, you have even got my bricks. He, you know, he, he didn't want to part with these bees too well. <laughs> he had reached the uh, uh, attitude of grumbling because he didn't want to see his bees go down the road. So we got him home and to my place about nine o'clock, it was getting dark and we spent a couple hours trying to get them unloaded. And I knew nothing of bees. Here I go, it's contagious. I knew nothing of these, had no protective uh, equipment or anything. And so we were trying to slide these eyes out of the back of the pickup truck. It was getting, it was getting pretty dark. And when, when bees escape out of the old wooden hives, uh, when it gets dark, they don't fly. They, they want to crawl. So they'll, they'll fly to you and then they're crawling on you and, and it's impossible to get them off. So we were pretty miserable getting those unloaded, but we did. And it was just a, uh, first experience in my uh, uh, experience with bees. <clears throat> it's uh, now what what I'm here for, and I I said I would only take five or ten minutes of your time, and I think uh, seven thirty. You want to get out of here, or you want me to sit out and be quiet? So I'll probably <laughs> I'll probably not use up all the time. Uh, but I would like to offer you an opportunity to become acquainted with bees. And as gardeners and gardeners and beekeepers and farmers should be working more closely together. Bees are agriculture. Uh, here in Indiana, we're unfortunately under the uh, under the control of the DNR, but we should be agriculture. And in California and other states, we are. We're part of agriculture. Uh, as long as we have agriculture, we'll have honeybees because. A lot, a, lot, a lot of agriculture depend upon honeybees. My bees, uh, I, I live south on State Road 9, and I've been there 30 years. And maybe people have gotten used to looking over behind the shrubbery in the wintertime this time of year. You can see my beehives. Uh, well, this winter they've been missing because last fall in November, uh, I was offered an opportunity. And I, I don't know, I've never heard of a... Uh, uh, a backyard beekeeper like myself uh, being offered the opportunity to send bees to California. So my bees are in sunny California right now, helping in the pollination of the almond trees. And the, the, the farmers that have almond trees out there, the, they have to have, it's a must, they must have bees come in for the almond pollination every winter. And if they don't, if they don't have adequate bees, they produce 60% less almonds. 
And so there's areas in California that produce most of the world's hormones, at least as country's hormones. It's, I could I could quote, well, I can't quote without uh, referencing something, but uh, it's it's big business out there. There's beekeepers with 10, 10,000 hives. They're companies there, are not they're not called beekeepers, they're they're bee companies. And so, but there's only uh, maybe three commercial beekeepers in Indiana. It's just me. It's just me. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, there's only about three commercial beekeepers in Indiana. One of them is over here at Nice Town, and uh, beekeepers here work pretty closely with them. And new bee, bee, new beekeepers go to them for their first starts of bees. Uh, in the old days, uh, you know, when I first started, we could order bees through the mail uh, up from Georgia and Alabama and the southern states for $15. Or start of bees and the queen bees if you just wanted to buy one queen bee was only two dollars and fifty cents now they're forty dollars and of course the cost of wood is skyrocketed in the last couple of years uh, a, a big beehive uh, everything you need for one large beehive uh, goes for over three hundred dollars now so there's going to be fewer beekeepers fewer hobbyists i think take it up because of that right now anyway uh, but uh, uh, this is why I wanted to talk to you tonight. Uh, you can experience bees in your little garden, uh, no matter if it's a little garden or a big garden or what it is. And what I'm offering is a kind of a program where beekeeper and gardener can work together. And uh, I'm prepared this spring to, in April, my bees will come back in April. And I have uh, some something close to 40 hives. I'll be able to break up most of these hives. Now, I was looking for a change in my beekeeping practices anyway, and this is something that's going to work for me because uh, I'm going to make lots of these little nucleus hives out of the bees that come back from California. She's shaking her head. Now, are you getting the picture? I'm getting the picture. Now, We've been toying with this, Barbara and I, uh, talking a lot about it, and how should we how should we handle it? Because we don't, I don't want to put out bees to people and lose them. Uh, but here's here's what I'm suggesting: is that uh, I will leave con my contact information with you. I'll put it right here on the front table. It's a little business card. It has my uh, phone number and Barbara's uh, email and phone number. And please take one of these cards if you're interested at all and, and give me an email or a text with your name, address, and just say I'm interested. And uh, we'll get back to you uh, either texting you or probably by email. And we'll see how many people would be interested in doing this. Uh, but uh, what I would do is put a start of bees in the box. That would be a very small start. Uh, it, would only, it would be a queen bee. There'd be five frames of honeycomb in there. But it would, would be a queen bee and only enough bees to support that queen bee because we don't want it to grow very fast. Because we want you to put this in your garden or in your backyard, wherever you want to put it. And let these bees pollinate your plants. And it'll kind of introduce you to how exciting beekeeping is. Because there you have this box, you can watch the bees. And I guarantee you, if, if you if you feel a connection to bees and, and gardening, then it will be something you might want to continue. We might be able to do the same thing next year, or you could invest in a uh, full blown beehive and have it permanently uh, through the winter. But this is something that we can put in your garden and you can have them for summer. And then when July comes around, about July 15th, I want these bees back because they won't survive. In fact, I'll probably visit this after two or three weeks after you've had it uh, and make sure there's not too many bees in it. And if there's not enough bees in it, we'll will restore it and keep it going uh, for a period of time. And then in July, you, as I say, you can't, can't overwinter these 
these small nucleus colonies like this, you've got to let it grow. But by keeping it small, you're not going to disturb any way, any, anyone. Uh, and it'll be something I believe you can enjoy and, and learn a little bit about bees and then decide whether or not you want to go forth or do the same thing again or uh, not do it at all. So uh, I would, uh, I'm not sure if I would be bringing these bees to you or asking you to pick them up, or I don't know if I'd come out and pick them up or you'd bring them back to me. But we've set a kind of a, a price on it is $50. $50 for the pollination of your flowers and garden. And so after I get them back, I will use them in a way where they will survive the winter. We'll put them, they will join up with a larger beehive, go through the winter, or they will join up and go with my bees to California again, hopefully, if I have this opportunity. And I was told this morning I would have. So, uh, I have a question. Sure. If you already have bees, but they're not yours, because I have a lot of clover, and I know, you know, I like break for bees because when they're on the clover, yes. I stop. I know what you mean. And, and uh, let the bees get away before I vote. But I have a lot of bees and a lot of clover. And I was wondering if those bees you know, wouldn't get along with the bees. If I have bees too, there's a lot of bees there and they're not mine. <laughs> you know. I've never seen two bees fight on a flower. Well, when they join in with their with this group, no. they'll go back. They'll go back home. They'll go back to their own queen. Because I, I have yeah. no idea where it's all about the queen and the queen's pheromone, and they recognize that. If I if I come up here, there's bees in this box, and, and there's queen in there, of course. And if I come up here with a, a strange queen in a little cage, and they on top of there, they'll attack her. <laughs> they will not let her go in that beehive. And 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 the bees from two different colonies will often fight if if one bee tries to get into the other bee other colony. Now the only time they won't fight is if this bee is if it's an older bee to go out and forage. So the only time they wouldn't fight, if, if a bee has been out foraging and comes back to the wrong hive, they'll let her in. There are no oh, dummies. Yeah. She's, loaded with, she's <laughs> loaded with good stuff. So they'll let her in. The drone bee, the male drone bee, will be accepted by any hive. The, 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 the drone bees, their only purpose is mating with the queen. So they don't do anything. They lounge around all day long. <laughs> the other bees feed them. You know, take care of them. They can't make. But, so the drone bee can, uh, if a drone bee leaves my hive and goes two miles away and it's getting dark and say, oh, I better get home. Well, if he don't want to go home and he sees a beehive over there, he can go in. So a drone bee can keep leapfrogging all across the country. And that's how a good thing. What? How long do they live? I thought she was going to say, How long do I get? <laughs> <laughs> the, the drone bees are the, drone bees. Their life. Okay. <laughs> this is one of the uh, interesting things about bees. You know, the questions you're asking. And, and the interesting thing is that, sorry guys, you get kicked out in the fall because they're, they're not going to feed you. Through the winter. <laughs> and Pretty smart, huh? That's the message because the birds go potty in the hive as well, you know. And so they like giants giant. every fall. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there's no, but there's no. Kill them. They just kick them out. Yeah, you, you can watch in September and you see them go. And, and oh, wait, well, they had a good way before they had a good line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Have fun while you're here. <laughs> now, now it's fun to talk to school age kid, kids, you know, third and fourth graders. And I've had them, I've gone through the, the procedure of letting the kids uh, imitate bees. I'm saying, now we're going to pretend we're honeybees. And I take the worker bees, I put some of the kids there, and I put the drone bees over here, and I put the 
the young worker bees somewhere else that's because a, a bee has to get so old before it goes out and forages. So you have nurse bees and you have bees that do nothing but cleaning and so forth inside the hive. They have different responsibilities. How old do they, they have older. to be before they go out to collect? What is this? Three weeks? It's about a month. I think it's like 21 days. Oh, um, yeah, okay. yeah it take, but it takes 21 days from the time the egg. egg well, not the egg. No, no. Once we've already emerged, we're, we're yeah. on that bee. We've emerged. And then, you're left, and then it's another 21 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we don't want to get in a fight here. <laughs> but, but you know, if this room is full of beekeepers, you have different opinions. There's different ways to do things. And so sometimes, you That's know, one beekeeper doing it this no, way, another one doing it this way, and it gets, gets really interesting. Do all of you guys have such a sense of humor? <laughs> all you beekeepers? Uh, <laughs> well, I think it's changed through the years. Used to, used to beekeepers were very private people, and they did not want other people to know the craft of beekeeping. I don't know why. But beekeepers are different now. They're more like her. They're they're happy to talk about. It. <laughs> we're just happier people. <laughs> Ah, am I going by my time? Uh, so be sure to take one of my cards if you're interested at all. And outside the front door on the left as you go out is what we call a garden hive. She made mention of it. It's just a little guy, little hive that is manufactured for the garden. It's not a big tall thing. You're not going to get a lot of honey from it. Uh, it's a, we could call it a pollinator hive. And it's one that you could keep in your garden. But our, our problem with bees here in Indiana is bees die, but they used to die in the wintertime. So in, in July and August and September, we start preparing our bees for winter. We have to, to get them through the winter. We have to do medications and everything necessary to get them through the winter. And the only way that you can get a small colony like this through the winter is stack them together. So you have 10 or 20 in a bundle. And then a percentage of them will survive. Oh, wow. But uh, it's, it's how would you like to have a dairy where, you know, 40, 50% of your cows died every year? That's the way it is with beekeeping. That's the way it is. Do you sell your honey? Uh, I, yes. No, I used to. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> but I used to. I used to sell about 2,000 pounds a year right from my front door. People came to the front door, took it out of a little box, shelves, and uh, put the money in a jar and left. And I never left. I never lost any, any honey. Beekeepers are pretty much honest people. People that buy produce, I think, are honest people. You can do the or leave the leave the money in the jar, sort of thing. You get in the yard sales and garage sales. Not the case. <laughs> Any other questions? Be sure to look at the garden hive out front. It's cute little hive. And if they like people like to paint them up, I don't paint mine, but people like Amy here does. <laughs> <laughs> that look good. Okay, so there's some beautiful hives sitting around all painted up. But the bees don't care what color it is. But they do like blue. Thank you, Juan. Um, I thanks very much to Amy. Uh, I am gonna head out, but I just think it was a wonderful program. So aloha everybody. I'll see you when I get back and thank you and please. Continue the question and answer. Bye now. <laughs>
Keep them, keep them small like this. If, we, if you don't take these out, I think it's more about they get too proud. But you take them out, right? uh, yeah. I need to put them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But and then next year you do the same cycle again. Yeah. If, uh, if a gardener is wanting just these for pollination, yeah, I would have to go maybe. Maybe after, maybe three weeks after I started the dog, I'd go there and make sure they're not going to be. Oh, yeah, the library. Okay. Now, what do you do in California? Or are they used as pot Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. And you actually are there moving pollinators. I mean, a business. Did you take out? Did you take your bees out to this is a guy's acreage and turn them loose and yeah. wait? Get yeah, back. I, I'm not down that. Oh, okay. Uh, small yeah. orchard people sometimes will call and ask if a beekeeper can break a bee's orchard. Yeah. But uh, if somebody calls it somewhere, I'm not going to turn them down. I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to be so. I'm getting. Uh, I'm getting to the, the age. Okay. It's just summer. I'm just like, I'm going to be down and come up with a message. All right. I'm going to be able to put it. Yeah. Weighs about anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds. And I'm going to have to stop with it. So I just want to do that. Probably use a new reception. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the honey like, over there. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'm sure is an interesting the ones that we were presentation. The presentation. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, it's just, it's just, just a way of introducing bees to people. Uh, 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 I like to see yeah. soybean farmers yeah, like utilize these more because, because it increases yeah, that. Right. You know, they have combines out. As they drive their combine along, they can get a read out every minute of what their beans is producing, what their beans are producing every minute. Right. Yeah, I knew they had GPS. Yeah, and if they'll set the beehives out there, when they go by the you know, two or three acres in front of their beehive, they should show an increase in production. Interesting stuff. Yeah, thank you. Six, 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 six
flowers. <laughs> or, I'll ask so she yeah. can have a little Lots extra things. Things. Yeah. On a small scale, it's hard, it would be hard to say that, say that you know, she don't the come. pollination is helping. Uh, because it's not still under the pollination. Uh, sure. sure. Beside the yes. Yeah. But it sounds like it sounds like it's a fun one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good to hear. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 I know where the light is. Yes. The computer's gone. It'll, it'll, it'll go up. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's somebody if still running around with me. Nobody knows how to run it. So it's never that at all. Yeah. They don't want me running it. Thanks for reading my tech support. Thanks for reading my tech support. Oh, you're welcome. It wasn't too hard. I'm sorry. No. What happened? It's always good. It's always good to practice. It is. It is. 